want you to turn to 2 Corinthians with me. You know, the Corinthian church is a lot like our church. It was messed up. And we're all a mess, if we're honest. And uh, Paul had big problems with the church of Corinth, and he, he deals with them in the first and the second letter. One of the problems that he deals with in the second letter is that there were some false apostles that were circulating around that church that were saying that Paul was not a real apostle. And so as a result, he had to defend his apostleship. But the key truth that you can trace throughout the whole book of Second Thessalonians, or why do I say that? Corinthians, Corinthians, is this truth. You ready for it? Because it's a paradox and also an oxymoron. And it is this, the strength of weakness. That sounds contradictory, doesn't it? The strength of weakness. But I don't have time, but I can show you that truth in every single of the 13 chapters. The verse that uh, perhaps most shows that truth is verse 9 and 10 of chapter 12. This is where Paul has that thorn in the flesh, and he prays, and God doesn't take it away. And God tells him instead, my grace is sufficient for thee, for listen, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so then he, he says, okay, then most gladly, therefore, I will go, I'll boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, the strength of weakness. It's even in the 13th chapter, the last chapter, he's talking about his plans as an apostle uh, that involved them. And he said uh, in verse 3, you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but mighty in you. Verse 4, for though he, Christ, was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. Talking about his resurrection and the power that that entailed. So here's the principle. Here's the truth that I want to think about based upon the whole teaching of 2 Corinthians, and that is the strength of weakness. And it's this, that God's power to do ministry or to please God is only available to people who recognize their own personal inability to do anything. It's exhibited by people that know they can't do it. And as a result, they learn to lean on Jesus. They learn to lean on the Lord. And the reason for our inability is simply this. You are you, and God is God. You're the creature, and he's the creator. You're limited, and God's almighty. You're flawed, and he's perfect. You know, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, that great uh, uh, hall of faith, as it's sometimes referred to, there's a list of different people, men and women, throughout uh, that period of time that God used to do great exploits. And here's what we read, beginning in verse 32. He says, and what shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. And here's the phrase that the writer of Hebrews uses that really connects with what this, the strength, strength of weakness is about. Out of weakness were made strong. Out of weakness were made strong. Think about that for a moment. You know, Noah is mentioned in Hebrews 11. Did you know Noah got drunk? Yeah, he had his problems. Abraham and Isaac are both mentioned in Hebrews 11. Did you know that they both were liars? Yeah. 
Also in chapter 11, Jacob is mentioned. We know him. His name means heel grabber. His name really is the idea of someone who's a schemer, a conniver, a deceiver, a cheater. And he lied. Moses is mentioned in Hebrews 11. And Moses, he was a vigilante murderer. And Moses was also dealing with anger issues. In fact, because of his anger, he didn't get to enter the promised land. And you might say, well, I can understand why he got angry. <laughs> okay. But I'm just telling you about him. David, of course, is mentioned. And David was an adulterer. And David was a murderer. Samson's mentioned in Hebrews 11. And we know what he was like. He was a womanizer. All of these men that God used were sinners. And their sins really produced repercussions in future generations as well. Simply said, all these people that God chose to use were weak men. They were flawed men. They were flawed human beings like you and I. This is where we need to start. We need to make this acknowledgement that you and I are flawed people. That is all since the fall in the garden. That's all God has ever had to use. That's all God has ever had to work with. That's the kind of material he, he's left with. But that's not where he wants it to end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that this truth of strength through weakness would become very clear and uh, that it would be a powerful truth that we would learn and that would grip us and that we'd never forget it. Because if we are ever going to be anything for you and accomplish anything, it's going to be because we have come to acknowledge the fact that we are utterly without any strength, without the power to do what you desire to get done. We thank you that we can call upon you in this way. Be our teacher, Holy Spirit of God. Be that unction, that, that anointing. We want your anointing. Give us understanding from your word today. And Lord, may it stir us, make us, make us what you want us to be. Oh, God, as the song says, what grace is mine? What grace is mine? This is what we need. We want your grace. We want your strength. That's all we have to be able to function. And so, Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. So the acknowledgement of your weakness, your flaw. You remember that wonderful passage in Isaiah 40? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Verses, a couple of verses before that, it says that uh, he gives strength to them that have no strength. If you ever become the recipient of God's grace, God's strength, it's only because you've come to a point in your life when you recognize that you have absolutely, utterly no strength. None whatsoever. He gives strength or grace, if you want to call it that, to the strengthless, to those that are devoid of it, totally weak. Is there anything that is preventing you from doing what you know God wants you to do? Maybe it's some excuse. Maybe you think, I can't do that. Or maybe it's something that you know that you shouldn't be doing that God's been dealing with you about. Well, I would say the first step is acknowledgement. Confess whatever it is that is preventing you from doing what you know God wants you to do. Anything that's standing in the way, because this is holy ground. The will of God is holy ground. It's what our life is about. And realize that... Uh, that God can only use you and I if we own up to our insufficiency. 
I said 2 Corinthians is all about that. Paul says in the third chapter, he says, you know, the ministry that I have now as a, a servant, a minister of the new covenant, he said, I'm not sufficient for this, but my, my sufficiency is in God. That's what he says. And I, and all of us, have to readily acknowledge that. There's that acknowledgement. And then a second thing, when, it, when we're talking about inability, it's not only an acknowledgement of it, but also something that's irrelevant. And that is your personal ability. Is, is uh, or rather, I mean, your personal inability is never an excuse for not doing the will of God, for rejecting God's will for your life. I think of Moses. Remember when God met him at that burning bush? He gave four excuses, didn't he? The first excuse was, who am I? You know, he had an identity problem. And you know how God answered him? God answered him, it's not who you are, it's who I am. And he had another excuse. He says, well, what am I going to say? And he says, well, just tell him who I am. And then he had a third excuse. What if they don't believe me? And remember, he took him through a couple of uh, miracles in which he said, you know, I can prove. I can prove that you sent me uh, if you'll trust me. Remember that? put his hand in his cloak, brought it out. It was full of leprosy, put it back, and God had cured it. Threw his rod down on the ground. It became a snake, took that snake by the tail, became his rod. And God said, you don't have to worry about your inability. I can take care of that. And then he says, but I can't speak. We were talking about this yesterday in the men's breakfast because it came up. In Stephen's sermon, he says that Moses, in the first 40 years of his life, was mighty in words. He had oratorical ability. But he tells God, I can't speak. 40 years later, when he's 80, there on the backside of the desert as a shepherd for 40 years, he says, I can't speak. And God reminds him, well, Moses, who made your mouth anyway? Who makes the mouth? God can take your inability, and he can join his power to your weakness, his strength, and he can use it. So, inability. Second thing, and I'm I'm going quick because I want to I want to talk about this with you. The second thing is not about our inability, but which is you versus God. But the second thing is about our availability. How available are you to God? Are you available to God? Do you think God hasn't called you? God has called every one of you if you're a believer. We are all in the same vocation. In fact, he tells us in, he, in, in Ephesians 4.1, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He's not talking to preachers. He's talking to all believers. You're called. If you're a believer, you are called of God as his servants. Are you available to him? You need to learn to make yourself available to God. And you know where that begins? That begins with, listen to me, especially young people, it begins with your surrender to God. Where you give up. Seeking what you want to do, and you say, God, I want, I want in my life what you want. That's where availability begins. So have you surrendered? Are you available to God? Have you ever said, God, I volunteer? I don't know what, what you want me to do, but I volunteer. I surrender. Whatever it is, you fill in the blank. I'm surrendered to you. I remember when God dealt with me about that, and I was an 18-year-old, I think, at that point, and I surrendered. And it's made all the difference in my life and in many other lives. Yeah. Availability. God says, come. He's calling you. He says, come to me. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. You know, God can't use you if you don't come to him. 
If you don't make yourself available to him, that's very important. Don't keep your distance from God. Approach him. Look to the Lord. Seek to draw near to him. Try to listen to hear what he's trying to say to you, what he's speaking to you about. So come to him. Make yourself available by coming. And also, I think availability involves concentrating. Being focused on the Lord and the things of the Lord. Being interested in what God says and on the things of God more than, say, your career or current events or or sports or even other relationships. That God becomes the thing that you concentrate your attention on. And again, that will make all the difference in the way you live your life every day. Who or what is your focus? If you're available to God, you'll not only come to him, but you'll be concentrated on him. He'll be your focus. And if you genuinely genuinely seek him, God will, he guarantees, I'm going to reveal myself to you. And when he does, he'll direct your life and he will give you, for the first time, real purpose in your life. And the byproduct of that is you live a fulfilled life. And the third thing I want to talk about, and then we'll be done, and we can discuss this. The third thing is not only our inability, not only our availability, but even most importantly, God's ability. That is dependence on God, because God supplies all the power, all the strength, all the gifts that we need to have in order to do whatever he requires of us and whatever he asks of us. If you really own up to your inability, you'll have no other alternative but to then ask in believing faith, for his ability. You'll depend upon God. You'll depend upon him for strength. You'll ask believingly that uh, just as you took salvation that was offered by faith, you'll take his strength that is offered by faith. And to illustrate this, I want to talk about Moses again at that burning bush. Why a burning bush? Why did God meet Moses at a burning bush? Well, I think we should understand, first of all, that it wasn't a thing of beauty, the bush. It was not a beautiful thing. From what I have studied, that bush that God met him in was a thorn bush. It was just an old thorn bush. He he didn't take him to some beautiful desert oasis and and, uh, speak to him out of a beautiful palm tree or anything like that, but just an an old desert thorn bush. And I think he did so because I believe that this was an object lesson for Moses that he never forgot. Because you know what thorns really are? Thorns are leaves that got aborted And so they never developed and they never uh, opened up to fulfill the purpose for which they were intended to. That's what a thorn is. At that point in his life, at 80 years of age, Moses had not yet fulfilled the purpose for which God made him. You read the the story in Exodus, you read uh, the Uh, lesson about him in Hebrews 11, and you come to the conclusion that there was something special about this man when he was a newborn. He was different. There was a special purpose that God had on his life. You know what? God has a special purpose for every single life. And Moses, he was to be Israel's deliverer. And he tried it on his own. And he was mistaken because he supposed that all the other Israelites would realize that he is the man God would use to deliver them, and they didn't get it at that point. So at 40 years of age, 
He's exiled to the backside of the desert for 40 more years. He's 80 now, and God appears to him in this thorn bush. God shows up in this bush as fire. And yet this thorn bush that would be consumed in a moment isn't consumed at all. Because God is using this as an object. Moses, you're like this thorn bush. This is your purpose in life that you've never fulfilled. It's been aborted up to this point. And I think that God was trying to teach Moses that God, using Moses to fulfill the purpose for which he was created, is not based upon who Moses is, but rather who is in Moses. Just as that fire of God, the presence of God in that bush, who is in Moses to fulfill the purpose that God made Moses for, that life purpose. The purpose that God has for each one of us is only accomplished by the union of our forms with God, our inability with God's ability, the union of the two. It's not what I can do for God. It's not what you can do for God but rather it is what God can do in you and through you when you are dependent upon his ability. It's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says that the excellency of the power may be seen to be of God and not of me, not of us. That's the illustration of ability, that dependence upon God, Moses. And the exhortation here, that there is strength, there is strength through weakness, is not just the message of 2 Corinthians, like he says in that 12th chapter, for when I am weak, then am I strong. It's not just the message of 2 Corinthians. You know, when you think about it, it's really the message of the whole Bible. I don't know if you recognize that. Someone said, all God's spiritual giants acknowledge that they are weak nobodies who did great things for God because they depended on his strength and his power in them to work through them. So I guess we ought to ask ourselves this question. Am I weak enough for God to use me? Am I weak enough to then be strengthened and empowered by my Lord? That his might might be made complete in me? Here's a poem. I cannot do without thee. I cannot stand alone. I have no strength or goodness, no wisdom of my own. But thou, beloved Savior, art all in all to me, and perfect strength and weakness is theirs who lean on thee. 